My name is Paul Brindley. Uh, in my day job, I run a company called Music Ally, um, operating in the digital side of the, the music space. We also publish a, a free blog writing about apps, the app side. Um, but here today, I'm wearing one of my other hats, which is as a consultant to a program called IC Tomorrow. And IC Tomorrow is an innovation program um, run by a government-funded body, UK government-funded body, called the Technology Strategy Board. And the remit is basically to foster uh, innovation, to encourage uh, companies to develop new applications and services, all about really putting Britain at the forefront of the digital revolution. And uh, IC Tomorrow is uh, a digital program working across the board, whatever sector that may be. Um, as it happens, we do have uh, a contest which is live at the moment, so I do just want to make a um, brief reference to that. It's a digital innovation contest, and it's aimed at, it's not just startups, it's really, you know, any companies that want to innovate, where they can get actual money. Um, there's £25,000 uh, available to com for companies to answer very broad brush challenges across not just publishing, but also um, advertising and TV. Uh, working with partners including Fremantle Media and YouTube and a, a whole bunch of really interesting partners. Uh, and in publishing, we've got HarperCollins and Constable and Robinson. Uh, so if you go to ictomorrow.co.uk, uh, you can find out more about that. And I think you've got um, another, about another week or so um, to put in an entry if, uh, if you would like to uh, enter that particular contest and win some actual money. Um, today I'm going to invite you, though, to uh, invest some virtual money. So I'm going to give you all, by patronage, with no authority at all, um, let's say a thousand pounds, shall we? Let's, let's, let's be reasonable. I don't want to bankrupt myself. Um, and then uh, invite you, really, to, to choose who you're going to invest that money in of the eight companies that you're going to be hearing from uh, shortly. So we're going, to, we're going to have a vote, basically. You'll need a mobile phone in order to invest your, your money. Um, but there's no, there's no premium rate, don't worry, it, it's, it's all standard charges. And, uh, and then we'll, uh, we'll have a, a winner, you know, more, more for fun than, than, than anything else, but, but obviously a bit of prestige in terms of which company you think is the most innovative is the real key here. It's about innovation. That's what the IC Tomorrow program is about. We've also got um, some international companies. So we've got eight companies in total that have been jointly selected uh, by London Book Fair and I see tomorrow, and uh, we'll, be, we'll be hearing from them shortly. First of all, just though, quickly to introduce our judges who are going to be asking them um, some, uh, some questions and uh, for, for clarifications. So we've got Dan Franklin from Random House, um, who you heard from uh, earlier on, and uh, Sarah Lloyd from Pam McMillan, who's been here throughout the day, obviously. And last but not least, Frank Lampen. Um, from uh, Independence uh, United, who we haven't heard from as yet. So actually, just a quick word about what you do. Yeah, we run an agency where we help companies with um, innovation and product development. Um, as well as doing that for some kind of quite big global brands, we also invest in and incubate uh, companies, largely in the sort of kind of consumer internet space or with innovations around uh, content delivery uh, uh, and uh, marketing messages. So we've got about... 15 companies in our portfolio at the moment, um, and we are always sort of fairly active as investors with all of those companies. Thanks, Frank. So, um, straight on then to our first uh, presenter. And I'm, I warn everyone, by the way, that this, uh, my little iPad here, is going to make a nasty noise after six minutes. It makes a little beep after three minutes to helpfully remind uh, the presenters that that's sort of halfway through, and then at the end it makes a nasty noise, which saves me from having to be rude and saying, okay, that's it. But in order to get through all of them, we do need to stick to time. So um, our first presenter will be uh, Matt Bradbeer, Bradbeer from uh, Authorium. Matt. Hi guys, um, we're Authorium. Uh, I think the best way to describe, describe us is a collaborative cloud ebook publishing platform. Um, we are an ecosystem, so we've got authors that, um, that, that upload their work to us. Uh, we also have a community of uh, publishing types, so there will be editors, proofreaders, cover designers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, the whole concept of the platform is that it's very easy to use. Um, you upload your work. You've got full creative control. It's easy to create ebooks and then get them distributed globally, which is the bit that we do. 
Uh, we've got a couple of innovations that we're quite proud of. Uh, one of them is that we have an in-page editor, um, which allows you, to, after you've uploaded your manuscript, to edit it in-page. Um, at the same time, you can then open that up to the community, and they can comment on this uh, on your manuscript within context. They could highlight single words, sentences. They can comment on the whole whole text all the way through and pull out things. Um, we then publish and distribute across across the Vice eBooks all in one click. So once you're happy with it, once you think you want to get it published. You hit the, I want to get this published, and it comes off over to us, and we will either approve it or uh, we'll send it back and give you some feedback and say, no, you might need to change this or, or try somewhere else. Um, here's an uh, interactive slide which shows you a bit more about the process. So Authorium being a cloud, um, we have a digital publishing press. We also uh, we cater for the following people. We have authors, agents coming in with um, maybe their slush pile they bring across. We've got publishers that are working with us, um, trying to get some of their books, testing them out, maybe some of the guys that they want to put in full publishing. We've got some relationships with universities at the moment, especially some of the creative writing courses. They're a good source of guys wanting to uh, get, get themselves published. And also there's a lot of uh, publishing talent there in terms of uh, editorials and, and uh, proofreaders. They upload and create their... Uh, their manuscript, they then give it out to the, the community. And in the community, you've got, as I said before, all of these uh, book lovers, all of the publishing guys who will look at it and maybe help you edit it, maybe help you with the cover. And then, again, when you're happy with it, you send it to us. And off it goes globally to lots of retailers, distributors, and libraries. And we give back 85% of the net sales. Um, so that was a bit quicker than I thought it was going to be. Uh, so yeah, please ask more questions after three minutes are up. And here's some uh, things that some of our authors have been saying about us. Okay, thanks. Wow, well, you were you were quick. Yeah. Um, yeah. Questions from the judges. I'll kick off. Um, thanks for that. I was. There's quite a few services like this emerging at the moment, which offer one-stop solutions, yeah. especially um, cross-device. I wondered if you could talk a bit more about. How, uh, how you're setting up so that everything is compliant across the very fragmented device landscape that we have now? So, to be honest, there's two real ebook types out there. So, there's EPUB and Moby, and that gets you pretty much everywhere. And I think, given what I've seen in the music industry, when that went digital and I was working on that, you're going to end up with one, one format across the board, and that becomes device agnostic. So, to be honest, it's, it's a single click. You get the two, the three, actually, three formats we come out with. Um, and, and off you go. So it's, it's, it will come down over time, it'll be EPUB. And what would you say is your um, distinguishing, your USP? Because, <clears throat> again, picking up on Dan's point, there's quite a few things like this. So, yeah, what, so what's going to make authors choose Authorium? So I think it's the collaborative element on this. Right. It's the partnership element. So you've got, at one end of the scale, you've got traditional publishers, um, and, and that's how they work. And then you've got sort of self-publishing at the other end, maybe vanity publishing even further down sort of smack bang in the middle. There is an element of curation. Well, there's quite a lot of curation. There's the, the community that does a lot of curating. There's the whole concept that you, the finished article is not what's uploaded, but you do need that, that editorial, that, that curation, and whether that comes from us as Authorium, which is the final stage of it, or comes from the community. And are you purely working as a kind of matchmaking um, forum for yeah. fitting authors with editors or copy editors or whatever if that's what's needed yeah if that's what the author wants to do so uh, these are individuals these aren't companies these aren't publishing yeah. services these are individuals and it is about creating that community creating that collaboration and so later on as we develop you think about how do you how do you cap how do you get money out how do you, how do you monetize that relationship for the publishing freelancers or publishing professionals that are on the site and how do you how do you monetize those connections for Orthelium? what's your business model uh, at the moment, we don't. It's 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 a community. That's not that's not what that's not what we're doing at the moment. Um, our revenue streams are largely from sales, at the moment on, on after distribution. But as we go forward and we turn that into more of a formalised marketplace or whatever, then there, there's another revenue stream there. Uh, I'll ask a quick one actually. Um, so if I'm to invest my thousand pounds with you at the moment, though, how are you going to convince me I'm going to make a big return? There's nothing quite like us out there, and I think we've hit that middle ground that nobody else is in. And I think this is the way the industry is going to start converging towards where we're at. That's the really... They're breaking down in terms of where the revenue is going to come from, ultimately. Uh, so the revenue will come from the sales, obviously, and from that marketplace function that we've got. That we're, we're, we're 
happening in place. How, how are you going to build that community? Any because any any model that sort of says we've got a kind of community there, that it sounds great in theory, but how you how are you going to get to the kind of critical mass? So the best way to do it for us is really word of mouth at the moment, which is where we're at, because we're, you know, we're bootstrapped, so we don't have that huge marketing fund to go out and say this is what you want to do. So word of mouth is really, really handy. Um, and then again, I think it's on the, and this sounds like a cliche, it's the social networks, it's, it's, it's picking on the blogs, it's going into the forums, it's building up that presence very sort of organically as you go out. I don't think if you went in hardcore and said you're going to do this, it's, it will blow it apart, it won't make sense, it'll feel fake. Oh, I like to turn my thing off and didn't make the noise. So, <laughs> the other noises. But that should have been the noise. So thank you very much. Yes. The mad there we go. There we go. <laughs> Thanks very much to Matt Bradbeer from uh, Authorium. And uh, now our second presenter is uh, Emma Barnes from BiblioCloud. Thank you. Um, so 10 years ago, I uh, co-founded a genre publisher called Snowbooks. Uh, we've done pretty well, we've won a couple of nibbies and things, and our gorgeous books continue to do very well. But when we started uh, 10 years ago, there was no decent affordable software to help us run our business in the efficient way that we wanted. So eventually we developed a website to do that, and we called it Bibliocloud. As Snowbooks grew, Bibliocloud grew, and if it hadn't, Snowbooks would absolutely have choked on the weeds of data administration. After 10 years, there's still no affordable software to match Bibliocloud. But the Arts Council of England have given us a generous grant, and because Bibliocloud is hosted in the cloud and written in the open source web development framework Ruby on Rails, it's very cheap for us to run. We're now inviting other publishers to benefit from Bibliocloud, and we believe it's affordable for every publisher in the UK. I'll tell you how much people are paying for it in a moment, but first of all, let's have a look at what it does. So there's the bog standard Onyx title data metadata management aspect. Um, but you can see here, uh, user defined validations, and this is the sort of thing that really takes the system from just being a dumping ground for data into something to help with workflow, which helps you to get your data into a fit state for publication. Uh, you can filter data, data in useful ways. Um, this is so handy being the developer as, as well as a user. We can really build our own user experiences right back into the software. Um, being a website, it's easy to integrate with the rest of the web. Here's a live Amazon data feed, so you can check to see if it matches with the data in BiblioCloud. And here's Snowbook's live Twitter feed piped directly into, into BiblioCloud, and we get the latest Twitter results for each book as well. You can uh, manage estimates and dues and print specs and print and shipping estimates, and you can crawl everybody in the business in the right direction with schedules. Here's a missed milestone report for, uh, for management. So once all this data is in the system, you can start to do useful things with it. So here's your title verso page, uh, all ready to go. Here's a couple of examples of AIs, no more typing the wrong uh, ISBN number in. The system is really wide-ranging, but it has a great depth of functionality as well. So here's a report for production to manage consolidated shipments. Uh, and here's the, a bit of the right section, and this has got enough capability to replace standalone right systems. And I haven't even mentioned the, uh, the contracts and royalties section. Uh, we're very proud of its ability to manage very complex royalty calculations, and it's blisteringly fast as well. For instance, it takes uh, 800 milliseconds to, uh, to process Snowbook's 10 years of, of data. And I'm delighted to announce for the first time here today that our first two clients are the illustrious Quirkers and Osprey Publishing. Um, they're, they're joined by a host of smaller publishers, and I was going to tell you uh, how much people were paying for BiblioCloud at the moment. Um, all of those people, bottom right, uh, they're paying nothing, not a penny, thanks to the Arts Council who pay for all, of, all publishers in the UK uh, who turn over less than £150,000. They get free access forever. So, to finish, why choose us above all of the other excellent innovations today? Well, BiblioCloud gets a publishing business under control. It gives you stability and efficiency, and without this underpinning, any other innovation is built on sand. So get the fundamentals of your business right, stop firefighting, and then you'll have the time and the money and the energy to do the most creative, wonderful publishing. And it might not cost you a penny. Thank you very much. First question. Um, so it looks to me that this service is interesting because it blends um, a production workflow with a bibliographic system. Am I right in, in thinking that? So you upload a proposal there, for example, and then you can sort of follow the editorial processes through. Absolutely, yeah. 
And and to what extent do you are the, those editorial processes housed on the system? I mean, can you put iterations on manuscripts and all of that on there as well? Is that part of that? Yeah, I mean, it's it's definitely a metadata system rather than a content system. We don't right. go all the way through and create ebooks because there's plenty of good services that do that. But this is about this, this is a publisher's system for publishers, as you correctly said, managing the entire workflow. Do you find that um, even with something like this, people have issue doing stuff with the data? I mean, I see you've got marketing feeds and all sorts of other stuff. I mean, unless yeah. you've got people actually analysing that and doing stuff with it, how useful is that? Um, well, there's, there's two stages to that. There's getting the data right in the first place, and then there's using it and disseminating it. And <laughs> three minutes isn't a long time to show you um, all of the different things that you can do with that data. But um, the most important thing is getting all of your data into one place in the, in the first place, not having duplication across the company, right. um, and having um, assistance to validate that data. So, um, for instance, there are some really good industry-level standards that get your data into place, the BIC Excellence Programme, and in the Americas, the BISG stuff. Um, so BibliCloud helps you to either um, conform to your own in-house validations, you know, this is what we need for the marketing meeting, this is what we need for an AI, yes. um, also conform with, with industry standards. Um, and then you can start to do really interesting things with it. And it's not just limited to the metadata side of things, you know, contracts, we contain all of the contract information and rights information in the system. So tomorrow I'll be using BibliCloud's rights guide, at, you know, in my, with my other hat on as, as Snowbooks yes. manager. And is there a report, are there reporting functions so that you can kind of pull stuff together, useful groups of data together? Yes. Um, how, mu how much could a publisher save by implementing your system? Well, somebody said earlier on that when, you, when you're a startup publisher, um, you start with a blank slate, and that's the ideal place to start when you've got no legacy data and you, you start to um, input it from scratch. Um, if you get to the size of Snowbooks Company, you know, 300 odd titles um, and three, five, ten years of data, um, you're going to, it's going to change your life, working life. Perfect. Right on time. Thanks. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. There we go. Thanks very much to uh, Emma Barnes from BiblioCloud, and I emphasise the name, we're not to get confused, okay? So that's the first company, BiblioCloud. We do have two companies with very similar names and going in alphabetical order. They obviously go one after the other. So the next company is Biblo Labs, and uh, the presenter is uh, Mitchell Davis. Thank you guys very much. Um, so Biblio uh, Labs is a company that has a little bit of history. Biblio Board is a startup product. So I did want to give a little bit of background on the company, Biblio Labs. Um, I was part of a group of founders that founded a company called Book Surge. Um, it was the world's first integrated publishing and print-on-demand platform. And we sold that company to Amazon in 2005. I went out to Seattle, worked there for a couple of years, integrating the company and the technology, then joined back up with the former co-founders and we started this company. Um, in 2009, we actually became profitable, uh, focused on print-on-demand reproductions, and then in 2011, after the launch of the iPad, we launched our first digital product. And we did that in collaboration with the British Library. It was a 19th century books app and we learned a tremendous amount from that. And what we learned, it was downloaded almost 250,000 times in the first two weeks. It's been downloaded almost a half million times to date, tens of thousands of active users. So what we learned was that you could take these materials that had previously sort of been in academia and historical environments, and if you package them creatively, you could really make a huge mainstream crossover with those. And so we knew there were tens of millions of these objects scattered all over the place. And so what we set out to build was a curation platform that would let any uh, institution, uh, museum, anyone basically um, organize these objects, enhance them, and then publish them um, across all platforms. And so we built that tool. Um, and it's the first part of our technology, which is called BiblioBoard Creator. It's a web-based authoring platform for multimedia uh, we call anthologies, but also apps um, that work in an incredibly innovative way on the web, uh, but also work inside native apps on all tablets. So the net effect of that um, is that any museum, cultural institution, library, historian, professor can create elegant, robust app products that work everywhere with no technical budget, no technical project management, no technical expertise, which we think is incredibly disruptive. 
Um, the anthologies are comprised of books, images, memos, letters, audio, video, all sorts of different media. Um, and uh, to date, we have published over 200 of these anthologies, about 25,000 to 30,000 curated objects. Um, we have, with the British Library, with a host of other national libraries and big partners. Um, and we think by the end of the year, we'll be somewhere close to 1,000 anthologies, so it's moving pretty quickly. Um, the other thing we learned in this project was how thrilling it was for the British Library to be able to serve this group of people that were outside of their normal sphere of influence in such a compelling way. Um, and so we set as a goal for our company, even though we work in the library space, that we were not going to measure ourselves against other library companies, that we were really going to try to meet the bar that was being set by Amazon and Apple and Google and these companies that really create super, super simple um, media experiences. And so this is the second part of the technology, which is BiblioBoard Library. So any product created on Creator flows seamlessly into this system, and we sell this as a subscription database to libraries. And one of the innovative things about it is it really redefines the library patron relationship in that there's no concept of checkouts, returns, multi-user limits. Um, the first time a patron identifies themselves on a device, everything that library subscribes to just shows up on the device and it works, which is what people using tablets expect. Um, and so we've not only, we think, in created this incredible delivery mechanism for libraries, but we've also driven enormous amounts of cost out of the process of building these products. So we sell this to libraries at an amazingly disruptive price point within the budget of any library on the planet. Um, and we think the short-term business opportunity for us is, is going out and there's over a million libraries. Um, we're aggressively trying to get as many of those guys as possible on our platform. Um, so I guess in summary, to sort of summarize our vision, um, you know, we all contribute to the library system through taxes, through tuition, whatever it is. Um, and we think that it's time that libraries played a major role in the general consumer media experience. We think that can do powerful things for making sure the digital divide is bridged and it can really be transformational. It will also be a great business for us. Um, so we have a proven track record disrupting in this industry. Um, I've worked with a lot of really great people, but I've never worked with a team better than the one we have working on BiblioBoard now. So we're incredibly optimistic about the future and very happy you guys had us. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> right, we've got just over a minute for questions, so Frank. How, how many customers do you need to sign up to, to get to break even? To get to break even? Yeah. Uh, we probably need to sign up about 500 libraries, something like that. So we're negotiating now. We've signed two very large, we have no library sales force. So we've signed two really large library reseller agreements. We're negotiating a couple more. We're doing a lot of direct deals ourselves with countries and counties and, and places like that. But we're really working with a lot of the more, I guess, the players in the library space to get it out there. Because the publishing tools, I mean, you know, a lot of academic libraries now want to be publishers, and this is a tool that facilitates for that for them really easily. Dan, are you finding that your clients are using the multimedia capabilities much, the enhancements, or are they? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have we just published the first third-party anthology that got published was a punk rock anthology, 90s punk rock anthology, and the guy's been published by University of Texas, Rutgers, all these different people, and he had never had a forum by which to show posters and set lists and songs and videos and photos. So yeah, it's absolutely the multimedia is being used for sure. Because it's all in one interface. It's not a book trying to play a video. Okay. It's an interface that manages that well. So. That's the noise. So thank you very much. That's Mitchell Davis from Biblio Labs. Uh, now on to our fourth uh, presenter, Erica Brodnock from Charisma Kids. Right, so hi everyone, I'm Erica Brodnock. I'm the founder and CEO of Charisma Kids. So I just wanted to tell you a little bit about myself. Um, about five years ago, I was diagnosed as having bipolar disorder. And I was told that medication was the only option every day for the rest of my life. Uh, I embarked on a journey of self-discovery and I found some amazing tools and techniques that enabled me to turn my life around completely and to actually be certified as well uh, by the same psychiatrist that had actually diagnosed me in the first place. 
So I began to look at the effects that uh, my illness had had on my own children. And I started to um, look at how I would be able to teach them the tools and techniques that I'd learned in a way that would be easily understood by children. So I did some research and I found that one in four children in the UK is currently experiencing some sort of anxiety and depression at some point throughout their childhood. And then one in 10 is going on to be diagnosed with um, an actual mental health disorder. So there are 4.3 million children between the ages of three and nine in the UK. And I thought that those stats were overwhelming. So I pulled together a team of passionate parents, teachers, a child psychologist, the design and technology industry, and um, we've created what we're calling the definitive prescription for happiness, confidence, and creativity in children. So that's a fun, safe online platform that enables children to both identify and then subsequently manage their emotions while they play. So we've been accepted into a growth accelerator program. So from next week, we're going to be pro uh, producing the first version of Moodville. So Moodville will see children able to um, rate and track their moods. Um, learn the techniques that will take them from places like Fear Farm um, over to the Gratitude Gardens, um, co-create their own e-books as well. And while all that's going on, we'll be collecting data and presenting that back to parents so that they can keep a handle on their child's emotional health and well-being too. So how do parents and children feel about Charisma Kids? Well, of 633 children asked, 90% uh, agreed that, the, um, that our techniques help them to stay calm, and a whopping 98.25% of parents um, think that Charisma Kids is fantastic. So what next? Well, we already have an awesome range of storytelling dolls um, that are actually receiving high acclaim in the market at the moment. Uh, and the brand easily lends itself to publishing opportunities. So I'd love to chat further with anyone um, who may be able to offer public, publishing opportunities, second round funding, um, partnership or pilot, opportun pilot opportunities too. So thank you very much for listening. I'd like to invite some questions from the panel. Thank you. Sarah? Hi, I'm sorry if you did say this, but the, you've obviously got a, by the looks of the graphics, there's a sort of quite a particular target age range. Yeah. What, what, what are you exactly aiming for? Aiming Three to for? nine years Three of age. Three to nine. And do you have any plans to go beyond that? Um, yes, there are plans um, for future expansion. Uh, this is Moodville for the younger target range, and we will be building Moodropolis at some point, um, which will be for the 10 to 13-year-olds. Uh, I mean, I was just wondering how you were thinking of marketing this and framing it within, um, you know, I guess the, the overall debate around mental health in, in young people and and how you might counter criticism for saying that you're trying to come up with a one-app solution for something which is a very multi-layered problem. So uh, what we aim to do is work with schools um, to have this integrated as something that children are able to do as part of their PSHE lessons and then uh, revisit throughout the day if things go wrong and they need um, a way of being able to calm, centre and return to um, a, an emotion like love or gratitude or joy. Um, and, and I think by doing that, what we're doing is offering a, um, a part of a solution as opposed to saying this is a panacea for mental health. Um, could you tell us a bit more about the marketing strategy? So you've mentioned schools though. Are you planning to market it directly to, to parents as well? Um, yes. So um, the, um, the company's already building quite a following um, among parents and uh, others that work with parents, parenting experts, etc. And um, parents are seeing this as a real option um, in terms of just helping their children to learn about how they might be feeling, why they might be feeling that way, and what they can do to shift into a more positive emotion. So it's spreading by word of mouth, and that's happening organically already. Um, we'd also like to sort of look at possible advertising equity deals, and, um, and that's why partnerships is one of the things that I've spoken about as wanting to do. 
time for one more question. I mean, I mean, I guess my other question would be there's quite a lot of um, character-based children's app work going on at the moment, and I just wondered, aside from the mental health element of what you're doing, how you differentiate yourself in what is very actually quickly, coming? Very quickly. Well, it's partly about the data as well. So um, it, the data that we capture makes um, ensures that children are truly safe. <laughs> I said it was very quickly. Sorry. <laughs> We're going to have to well, move on there. Thank you very much. Very much. Erica Brodnock from uh, Charisma Kids. So um, we've heard now from four companies, Altherium, BiblioCloud, BiblioLabs, and Charisma Kids. We have four more to go, and our next uh, presenter is James Huggins from Made in Me. Um, hi everyone, I'm James Huggins. Um, I'm the uh, CEO and co-founder of Made in Me. We're a little uh, studio in Shoreditch, and we set about trying to explore various ways that technology can be used um, and experimented with in order to create new kinds of storytelling experiences for kids. Um, and I want to talk to you quickly today about me books. What I'm going to do first is I'm going to use up one of my three very precious minutes to show you a video, because everything gets easier once you have a better idea of exactly what it is I'm talking about. Um, so, here's me books. there to save on seconds. So um, MeBooks is, the, the way that we thought about it initially was we wanted to create the picture book app. Um, we started off with the experience of picture books and looking at a brief of creating picture book apps that um, didn't in any way mess with or forsake or undermine the narrative experience, the experience of the actual physical picture book. Um, so th the first thing we said was, well, we can't touch the content then. We're not allowed to go in and manipulate it in any way. And we will use the technology in order to um, fortify support and enrich the experience that happens around picture books, which unlike adult books, as, as a lot of you know, is very collaborative, it's shared, it's very vocal, um, uh, and um, very creative. So we conceived of this idea that you could simply just draw anywhere on your favorite picture books and um, record your own voice. And by doing so, you would be attaching interactive hotspots. Um, you could create multiple versions of any one picture book. You could have granddad doing the voices, the kids doing the voices, and so on. Um, and from there, we, we essentially built the idea that this couldn't just work for um, a particular picture book or a particular series or set of picture books, but it could work for all of them. So um, we launched MeBooks just before Christmas um, as a platform to allow families and kids to access popular picture books through an in-app shop um, that would actually, where we'd publish books and titles from lots of different publishers. Um, and it's been, it's been an amazing success so far. We've um, done deals with publishers, uh, including Penguin, Hachette, um, Egmont, Bloomsbury, Scholastic in the UK. We're currently talking to and have done some unannounced deals with European publishers because we're very interested in the non-English language side of things, as well as US publishers as well. Um, and at the moment, there's about 140 titles, um, including classics like Peter Rabbit, modern Peppa Pig, Charlie and Lola, and with some great literary uh, modern picture book illustrator authors in there as well. Um, it's currently downloaded. Um, on average, we do about 1,000 downloads of me books a day. Um, uh, from, which is the app itself, which is free, and then you get a free book, and once you've enjoyed that, you can go into the shop and buy um, more books off the back of it. So in terms of innovation, 
I would say that the, 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 the main areas of innovation for us were one around the product itself. We actually wanted to um, capture what's great about picture books and create a genuine reason why you would want to experience this on a tablet, on a phone, and not just wish you had the physical um, object or edition. Um, and with the drawing and recording, um, in terms of innovation, we actually successfully managed to patent that ability, which is essentially just audio annotation. So if anyone here can think of any other uses for a draw and annotate with, with audio, then obviously I'm all ears, because um, there, there may well be um, exploitations of that beyond the way we've applied it here. And then in terms of the business model with publishers, um, we've done a lot of work with the publishers early on. Um, our, our, our initial raft of partners were... Uh, were very accommodating of a, a new kind of business model, which is a combination. Sometimes it's a licensing agreement whereby we license content to this platform. Other times it's distribution. But we see ourselves, in, in actual fact, someone described it as the digital equivalent of an independent children's bookshop. And that's precisely what we are. Um, it isn't just a slogan. It's very much uh, the case. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, I've, got a, I've got a quick question. So I can see how, um, you know, there's tons and tons of children's book apps that do lots of the things that yours does. But yeah. I can see how having the platform, the one place to buy lots of books within the app is, is an interesting uh, proposal. Um, how do you actually aid the dis uh, parents and children discovery process within the app? So they've, they've got the free app. What happens next? How do you push content to me or find out what my likes and needs are and, and make sure I get the right content served to me? Absolutely. There's, um, we're, we're actually working on, in the next three or four weeks, we'll be launching a new update of the shop. And essentially, from the, from the main screen, it was very quick, but there's a shop button which you launch. It's very much what you would expect. It's quite iTunes-esque. There are some banners for featured books, Book of the Week. There'll be special offers. Um, there's promoted titles within it. But also... Sorry. sorry. That's the noise of death. That's all right. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thanks very much to uh, James Huggins from uh, Made in Me. Uh, and now on to our next presenter, Taryn Ann Anderson from Paperwrite. Okay, I'm Taryn from Paperwrite. As you can see, my colleague Oscar and I were going to do this presentation together, but unfortunately he can't join me on stage. But I'm going to tell you Oscar's story anyway. When he was about 12 years old, Oscar became engrossed in a quite saucy and very racy uh, biography of Louis XV's chief mistress, Madame de Pompadour. It was the very first book that he ever owned, and he found it on top of a pile of books in his primary school hallway, which were about to be thrown out and burnt by teachers who were making space for a new teacher's lounge. His fascination with 18th century French court history is made more bizarre by the fact that he was reading this book in his very rural hometown of Umzumkulu in South Africa, where there is no bookstore and no library, let alone any perceptible interest in 18th century French court history. Moreover, he didn't get access to a library until his third to last year of high school, and still there was no bookshop. Luckily, Oscar's story is one of the happy ending, and today his bookshelves are filled with many hundreds of books like any good bibliophiles. But in many areas in South Africa and the rest of the developing world, access to books remains difficult. Ebooks and traditional print books currently only reach an estimated 2 million people in South Africa. That's 4% of the total population, and it's not good enough. At Paperite, we aim to reach those people who struggle with access to books immediately. To do this, we've chosen to embrace the opportunities presented by existing technology. In many countries, especially in Africa, photocopy shops are ubiquitous. We enable these photocopy shops to become legal, print-on-demand bookstores. We do this by providing them with instant licensing and printable books on a simple, low-bandwidth website that they can use in store. Now, all a business needs to print and sell books is any printer and an internet connection. Outlets have a pre prepaid account with Paperite, which they use to purchase licenses. As a publisher, you earn a license fee every time a photocopy shop prints out one of your books. We found that publishers can earn as much gross profit 
from a paper write edition as they do from a regular print edition. And still, the book usually ends up cheaper to the end customer. <coughs> Paperwhite is already the world's largest network of print-on-demand copy shops. We have over 150 active outlets throughout South Africa. As a result, paper art outlets now exist in places where bookstores have never been before, like Pedi, a rural town in South East Africa's Eastern Cape, and Kailicha, a sprawling township outside of Cape Town. Our vision is to help put every book within walking distance of every home. Thank you. Right. Three minutes for questions. So, Dan, you want to kick off? Yeah, I just want to. I think it'd be interesting to have just a bit more detail how exactly it works. I mean, I'm really intrigued by the idea that you sort of legitimise these outlets. Um, could you just give us a bit more information about how the technology works and that side of things? Sure. I like to explain paper rights as a non-digital medium that's delivered through a digital platform. So essentially the customer facing side is print media, it's not digital media, but we're using the, the existing technology that is available in a lot of rural towns to deliver that print media. So what our website does essentially is list a catalogue of books which you can purchase a licence for. We also like to think of it as an instant licensing um, kind of marketplace. So you can put any book or document of any kind on paper right and then easily have that sold uh, uh, via that mechanism to a photocopy shop who then prints out a uh, PDF for their customer. Interestingly, it has a watermark on every page to obviously uh, prevent um, piracy, I always want to say plagiarism, to prevent piracy, um, and we require that every customer's name, uh, surname, and cell phone number is uh, recorded in the process of purchasing the license so that their name is actually printed on the bottom of, of each page of the document that they purchase. It creates a sense of ownership and facilitates an ecosystem of trust, which we believe uh, kind of facilitates that legitimization. And what's the, what's the business model for the copy shop? The copy shop earns um, increased uh, revenue based on their printing. I don't know if you know how they work, but most copy shops rent their printing device from a organization like Nashua in South Africa. I don't know if you have Nashua everywhere. Um, but they'll pay a capped figure for a certain amount of pages printed out. And as they raise the amount of pages that they, they print, the total cost is reduced for them. So what we do is try and encourage a lot of printing so that their total costs are reduced yeah. while they, their actual printing is also increased. But, well, are you encountering any resistance from publishers who have given you the rights to works to put on paper right? We actually have had a really great response from all of the publishers uh, that are working with us. We find that there's initial um, difficulty in finding out how to fit Paperwhite into their current workflow and system because it is so different and new uh, that it can sometimes be difficult to facilitate that. And that's where most of the teething happens in, in our experience. Okay, well there's just five seconds to go, so before the nasty noise goes off, um, thanks very much to Karen Allen for Paperwhite. Right, and uh, moving on in our international coverage, um, our next uh, presenter is Marcello Vena from um, RCS Libri. Good afternoon. This morning, there is a keynote speech where Lactinson was uh, talking about innovators and startup, and he also asked uh, where are big publisher. Our answer to this question is, here we are. Please start with the video.
Okay. So what you saw here is not science fiction. Actually, it's real. We um, just launched, uh, launched four months ago. Um, 500,000 passengers every month can uh, enjoy full book reading while they are traveling. Basically, basically, all you can read for free as long as, uh, um, uh, as, long as you are aboard. Basically, we have a construct. We have built a virtual and yet real bookshelf for, um, for our book to be discovered. Uh, books aboard feature a selection of front list, new release titles, and also back list titles, so as, so as to improve and increase visibility and uh, discoverability of our uh, titles. Passengers, once they get off the train, then uh, hopefully will remember and uh, will have more reason to buy the book they have started reading, and, uh, uh, and this will help, of course, sales. Uh, the other very important point is that through streaming technology, um, we can unlock a new um, uh, paradigm shift, what we call discoverability 2.0. Uh, I will get uh, there in a minute. Uh, this technology, this streaming technology, actually allows us to stay in touch with our readers dur during their, their entire duration of their reading. So we don't just sell books, we stay in touch with them as long as they read. And so we can measure whatever they do with, their book, with our books, how many pages they, they, they read, how, how quickly they, they go from one book to the other, or how many pages on the same books. Uh, this allows us to measure many things. Such are things that we are, we are currently measuring, and they give us a lot of insight about, uh, about reader, reader, reader population and social demographic. And we have learned many things about uh, also how people use devices. However, those kind of uh, statistics are a bit too aggregated to help us to discover this kind of, uh, this new uh, discoverability paradigm. Indeed, we can measure actually it all. So for any book, we can measure what, uh, what any reader is doing, how many pages uh, is uh, reading, how, may, how long, and so on. And the same applies for any readers. For any reader, we can know how many books they read, and just remember, the, tra the travelers are frequent travelers, so they go back and, uh, and forth on the train. So we can accumulate statistics over multiple journeys. Uh, this allows us basically uh, to unlock a new discoverability paradigm, a new vision, whereby beyond the book discovery, we are going to go uh, about discovery of readers, who they are and what they do on top of uh, book discoverability. And eBooks Aboard is our first step to pioneer this discoverability 2.0. Thank you, and right, thank you. question are welcome. Um, so does it rely on a, a hard drive being on the train effectively, or is it cloud-based? No, it's wireless. It's wireless. So you have to rely on the train having a good wireless connectivity, right, for this? To well, the technology is good enough to, do, to cover everything, so it works also with satellites, transponders, so we yeah. have uh, also mobile uh, networks. It's a very complex tele telecommunication solution. It works also during tunnels while, while the train travels at 300 kilometers. What other kinds of data are you um, gathering on the consumers themselves? Because you're offering everything for free, so there's no transaction going on. Yes. Do they have to register? Yes. Uh, uh, as they, yeah. yes. and, what, and what other stuff do you collect from them as they? Yeah, what I, what I showed before, uh, actually basically all the data for any readers, and so once you have the content as publisher, and you know who the, who the readers are, you don't need any middleman in between, you don't need the Amazon in between, nobody, you can establish a relationship and sell whatever you like to them. So you're moving on to upselling them to, to buy content as a second stage or not yet? Well, I don't know, maybe, who knows. <laughs> That's the answer to that one, because there's the noise. Thank you. Thank you very much to uh, Marcello Bena from RCS Libri and uh, eBooks Aboard. Um, and now, last but not least, uh, our eighth uh, and final presenter in this session is uh, Joav Lorch from Total Books. very dark, doesn't it? Is that because I'm lost? I don't deserve any more electricity? I can barely see anything. Or because I did it on a Mac. Anyway, it says total books there. Hopefully the rest of the slides will look better. 
It did look good when I did it. Okay, start saving the 15 seconds. Hi, my name is Yoav Losh. I'm the founder and CEO of Total Books. Um, we're all used to buy books before we read them. This model of pay first, read later makes actually a lot of sense when you think of printed books. It's even essential in the world of printed books. But in the digital era, in the digital space, it's actually counterproductive because it, puts a, it creates a distance between the user, the reader, and the book. And in the digital space, you want to try and tempt the reader, bring the reader closer. And by sticking a, a confusing purchasing event in front of the nose of the reader when he wants to actually read something is pushing him away. So we've thought about it and we've created a different system that actually eliminates the need to buy a book ever. In our system, anyone is free to download any book, anytime, any place, at no cost. We monitor what people read and we charge them just for what they actually read. So our philosophy basically is download free any book you want, pay just for as much as you read. We think this is a major evolution in the publishing world since it brings some very needed elements to it. First is the element of freedom. You're, you can download, access any book anytime. The compelling decision is what to read, not what to buy. And second is the element of fairness. You pay for value. P readers pay for value they actually get and publishers and authors actually get paid for value they really deliver. So this is the main revolution that has many implications, takes us many, many places. I won't go into all of them, just a few. One is distribution. If there's a book that I have and I like it, I immediately send it to everybody, to all my friends. They can all get it. They'll pay for it if they read it, but I'm not sending them to Amazon. I'm not giving them a link. It's person-to-person -person distribution. Second is analytics. Every time someone returns a page, wherever it is, we know he's doing it. We follow, we know which people are engaged by which books, and we uh, use this analytics firstly to create a far superior, we believe, a far superior recommendation engine to what is available today. And secondly, we provide this information to publishers to assist them in navigating the digital space. And thirdly, by, by converging, by bringing together the point of discovery and the point of conversion, by merging the point of discovery and the point of conversion, we actually create fantastic new channels to attract new users and fantastic new channels to help users find new books. So if you go to our, uh, we are up, we've been up for about a week. We are, we've been working on this for, over two year, for about two years now. If you go to download your, our app to your iPad, this is more or less what your library will look like. And it's very easy to populate it. A click of a button on our website says add book and you can add books uh, to your uh, iPad or Android device. So this is a, a quick glance of our website. It launched very recently. There are 15, 000, uh, over 15,000 quality recent books on our site provided us by some uh, very good, special, professional, far-looking uh, partners that have all scrutinized us very carefully and given us all the full catalogs, among them Barrett Kohler, Constable Robinson, Elsevier, Red Wheel Weiser, Gibb Smith, O'Reilly, F&W Media, Sourcebooks, and others. Now, we don't want to win this conversation, uh, this competition, and please vote for us, but just as badly, we want your content. So agents, authors, publishers out there, please come work with us. We'll be very good, hardworking partners. We'll give you a lot of information that no one else would give you. Definitely not the Amazonians, you know, who tempt you but never reveal. And uh, yes, and I'll be here for the duration of the show. Happy to talk to uh, all of you. Many, many thanks. So if you look at the, the rest of the internet, there's, there's not many examples that show that consumers actually like that kind of metered access. Uh, in a lot of other areas, there's a lot of evidence that suggests that they like to kind of either kind of pay a fee, one-off fee, and then consume all that they want. But, but there's very few people who've made that metered access work. Why do you think consumers are going to want this? Uh, because it's books. You know, books is not music, and books is not games. It's, a, it's, it's not videos. 
It's a different type of experience, and we have to tailor the digital offering for it. So uh, books take, uh, you know, you have to read them over time, and it's, it, it, there's a decision, there's a the process there. It's been, you know, a number of people tried up subscription uh, service for books that, are, as far as I know, are not doing so well, because it's a different, uh, it's a different idea. You know, it's also, for, for, many, for many reasons. We, we think this should work with books, even though music, some other things work. A question? Uh, I was just wondering what the arrangement was with publishers, the business model. Well, it's a revenue share. We, it, you know, basically the uh, users pay for proportionally for what they read. They never pay for more, more than the book price. Uh, and what they read is what they own. You know, uh, they actually it's a purchasing mode. They, what they read, they can uh, read uh, for as, as long as they want. And we, it's a revenue share with the publishers. Whatever you make, we give to the publishers. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So, we've heard from our eight uh, presenters, and good, we've got the slide already there. So, it's time for voting. So, all you need to do is text one of those codes for the one company that you want to invest your thousand pounds of, uh, of my invented money in. Um, but think, yeah, think upon this as, you know, who is the most innovative? Who is the company that you think is going to go on and have the greatest success? Um, and the phone number to uh, text those codes to is 07624806527. Um, it might be worth actually just noting that number down. Um, but you've got uh, about sort of 10, 15 minutes um, to vote. You can only vote once, by the way, so don't try anything funny because it won't, it won't work. Um, and uh, the codes are for uh, Authorium, uh, the uh, Authors Community uh, Service 201530, then BiblioCloud, that was, uh, that was the UK uh, company uh, back-end system for publishers, 201586. Then it was BiblioLabs, that was the US uh, company doing deals with the British Library, 201590. Then we had Charisma Kids. Uh, which uh, was focused on mental health, the suite of applications for, for improving children's mental health, 201594. Made in Me, which was the apps uh, platform focused on children's apps, 201604. Then uh, Printing on Demand in South Africa, Paperwrite, 201611. Uh, then RCS Libri, and there we're thinking much more about the actual application there, ebooks uh, aboard. Um, that's 201664, uh, and you've just heard from um, Total Books, um, 201666. So, yeah, please scribble down the code if you're not um, made up your mind as yet. Scribble down that phone number and vote uh, once, and you don't worry, it won't be charged at Fortune. It's normal rates, I'm assured. Um, and uh, we're going to come back, and uh, Sarah is going to announce uh, the winner and, and give them uh, a little uh, award as well after the, after the next session. But uh, just a big, big thank you to, to our splendid judges and their questions, and uh, to all of the eight presenters who did so well there. Thank you very much. We're just reaching the end of the conference now, and all that remains is for me to uh, award the IC Tomorrow uh, Prize. First of all, I want to give an honourable mention to the clear second place, which was for BiblioCloud. So, Emma, congratulations on that. But there was a clear winner, which was Paperwrite. So if Taryn and Anderson would come up to receive the award.